So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I know you're still munching on your lunch, but uh, we're going to try to keep the agenda on schedule. My name is Stephen Wasser. I'm the president of the Lyric Stage Board, uh, one of the people who've been meeting with the theater leaders group, uh, which I have to say would probably not exist except for Joan Lancourt, who has <laughs> She has been the guiding force uh, who has made us meet on a regular basis, and I think those meetings have been productive. Uh, as you probably already uh, knew before you got here this morning, and based on John Beck's presentation, Boston is a culturally rich place. I don't know if it's John who told me or someone else, but according to what I've been told or heard, <coughs> we have more cultural events per capita than any other city in the United States. Uh, so I think part of today's, the purpose of today's meeting is not to figure out how we can get more cultural events, but how we can get a higher level uh, and a broader level of participation within our community. Uh, so to that end, the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, uh, appointed Julie Burroughs, who is our next speaker, as the chief of art and culture. Uh, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I think it's the first time the city has had a chief of art and culture. Uh, you have been warmly and enthusiastically welcomed by the cultural community of Boston, and even though we have such a broad level of, uh, such a large amount of culture, I think that uh, we have a long way to go before we have exhausted the potential participation uh, within the community. <coughs> Julie Burroughs before, and she's been here now, according to our lunch discussion, about seven months. I feel like it's been longer. Uh, she has been very generous with her time with regard to uh, <coughs> the theater leaders group. She came and met with us several months ago. Uh, so we've already had a meeting with her, and I know she's been on a very active listening tour of the Boston cultural scene. <coughs> before coming to Boston, she was the chief of something in Chicago uh, cultural planning, <coughs> excuse me, cultural planning and produced a cultural plan for the city of Chicago. Uh, somehow she finds time in her schedule to teach in Beijing uh, as well as at DePaul University. So she's quite busy and uh, we very much appreciate that uh, she has come here today to share some of her uh, understanding that she's been getting over the last few months of this particular community. Uh, something down there. <laughs> okay, we'll just kick it back under. So uh, anyway, um, thank you very much, uh, Julie Burroughs from the city of Boston. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today to talk about Boston Creates. Some of this might be a little familiar to you. I hope that many of you have had a chance to participate in our planning process, but I won't take any of that for granted. I'll give you a little bit of background um, and catch you up with what we've been doing. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, I am new to Boston. I came here in December and began my job as Chief of Arts and Culture reporting to Mayor Marty Walsh. I oversee the Arts and Culture Cabinet and run the Office of Arts and Culture, and that includes the Boston Cultural Council. Hopefully we've given a grant to many of you, the Boston Art Commission, and we also oversee several other programs. We're still a new department. We're very much ramping up, uh, staffing up, and evaluating existing programs. And although I do have many predecessors who I have, I'm meeting, um, who have led similar functions over the years, it, it's true indeed that Boston has not had anybody in the role of arts commissioner in the last 20 years, and never before as chief of arts and culture, which means I'm in the mayor's cabinet. Um, this all started, uh, probably very familiar to some of you, this all started a couple of years ago in 2013 during the mayoral primary, arts advocates began to ask all of the candidates would they support the creation of a cultural plan for Boston? Would they commit to bringing back the role of arts commissioner to the city? Marty Walsh committed to doing so, um, to doing both early on and ultimately, as you know, was the successful candidate. 
His transition team held town hall meetings, again, probably many of you participated in those, and produced an arts transition plan that greatly informs our early efforts. Um, as do these 12 values that were articulated very early on in the new administration. I feel like it's important to share those with you. Um, and of course in City Hall there's a little bit of skepticism about the fun part, um, but the good news is I'm finding my colleagues to be very collegial, very open to collaboration and receptive to new ideas. Um, and although my role is new and my department is sort of newly separated from a larger office, it's very important to recognize that we are not starting from zero. Efforts to bring arts education back to the public schools began over six years ago, and through the partnership between DPS and Edvestors, they've actually made very significant progress, especially in the lower grades and in middle school. There's a lot more work to be done at the high school level. And as you learned earlier this morning, there's lots and lots of data about arts and culture. This local community has been researched and studied at length and very deeply. So we've got great data to work with, and this is just a snapshot from um, a study called Culture Track from 2014, and this just was looking at the barriers and motivations of culturally active audiences. It's available online, it's very interesting. Um, and it shows, you know, not only what Stephen mentioned about having more events, um, but actually that people in Boston have heavy levels of participation. Um, and I'm finding that the cultural community is ready to plan, ready to think about the arts as a tool for improving all aspects of city life. Funding for the plan was secured very early on from the Barr Foundation and the Klarman Family Foundation. And even before our process started, coalitions of arts organizations and artists, such as from this snapshot in the Fairmont Corridor and the Boston Cultural Change Network, these are groups of people who are deeply exploring the role that the arts can play in community development and overall well-being. And I'm finding that change is in the air, literally over the Greenway. So many arts organizations in Boston are undergoing leadership transitions, and partners like the Greenway are undertaking large-scale, ambitious public art projects, like this one by Janet Uckelman, that I think just a, a couple of years ago, people would have doubted that Boston was capable of carrying out. But despite very enviable cultural assets, Boston's municipal funding is the lowest per capita among major U.S. cities. And it's trending upwards in the new administration. The city is committing to more funding for arts and culture. So our grant making has gone from $150,000 in FY14 to $300,000 in FY15 to $479,000 in FY16. So things are really moving in the right direction. And as you know, earlier this year, Mayor Walsh announced the launch of our cultural planning process, the first ever for the city of Boston. Our governance structure includes a 15-person steering committee that was formed over a year ago. It's half city staffers from a variety of departments and half arts leaders. And this is the group who very early on helped shape the request for proposals, brought on the team of consultants, and continues as a closely held advisory group to the process. We also formed a 60-person leadership council, a, open by, a, a membership open by nomination, and these are the people who will function a little bit like a board of directors providing higher level thinking about um, implementation and stewardship in the long range sustainability of the plan's recommendations. So we started our public process, again, with an open nomination for people to be on a community team. We formed 16 neighborhood-based teams, roughly equivalent to each neighborhood, and did this in six different languages to be sure that we reached all of Boston's diverse ethnic communities. And our team is large and multidisciplinary. The cultural planning group, who are a national consultancy that have done more cultural plans than any other firm in the world. 
They're the lead consultant. Wolf Brown is our research partner. Many of you probably know Denny uh, Palmer Wolf, who's based in Cambridge. Mark Minnelli is doing our um, branding and design. Archipelago is leading up community engagement. Calaman and Klein are doing PR and marketing. And of course, we have a team of artists. It wouldn't be a cultural plan unless we involved artists in our process. And they're called the Department of Play. So the plan is called Boston Creates. And the name reflects a core concept of creative capital, which grew out of Wolf Brown's work evaluating the Dallas Arts Learning Initiative um, which is now called Thriving Minds. And the hypothesis in that, in that instance was that a high quality, equitable system of creative learning opportunities will measurably increase families and students' creative capital and contribute to the overall capacity of the city to invest in and support a thriving cultural ecology. A big, big, big idea. And the idea is that individuals with creative capital lead richly expressive lives, solve problems, and participate in civic life. Parents and caregivers with creative capital are raising the next generation of innovators. Institutions with creative capital are both imaginative and relevant. Neighborhoods with creative capital forge social cohesion out of diversity. And cities with high level of creative capital encourage, reward, and integrate imaginative thinking into all aspects of community life. So this is the first time that the creative capital framework has actually been applied to a cultural planning process. This is really you're the first audience to get a glimpse of um, how the framework is shaping up into six key pillars um, that have emerged from our process. But I do want to caution that this is still a work in progress. And when all is said and done, it might change quite a bit. We're still working on translating the language of research into the vernacular every day. Um, so this is just a very early glimpse of that. Um, OK, and so what does a successful cultural plan hope to accomplish for the city of Boston? We want to understand clear priorities, um, understand how we can leverage the arts to achieve our civic goals, empower tomorrow's arts leaders, and foster neighborhood cohesion, articulate the role of city government and other partners, identify additional resources to the cultural sector, and incorporate arts and culture into city planning processes and municipal work. So notice, I didn't say create more programs. <laughs> so I'm completely in agreement with your earlier discussion today. Um, our process includes original research. We're conducting a survey. I hope that all of you have taken it um, and spread the word to your networks. It's structured in a way that by taking the survey, it actually helps you understand and realize what comprises your own personal creative capital. And um, as of this week, we're at about 2,500 responses. And the survey is open until the end of the month, end of September. Um, and once you take the survey, you actually get a real-time glimpse of what everybody else is saying um, in their responses. So this is just a word cloud that gets produced when you hit submit. Um, and so what else have we been doing? Um, we've been very, very busy this summer. Our public engagement started in June and wraps up at the end of September. Uh, we've taken a very deep dive into various networks via focus groups. You can read them out. I won't, um, I won't read them all out for you. Our, our publicly facing process kicked off in early June with a large town hall meeting. Hopefully some of you were there. And uh, we had about 500 responses and uh, 500 attendees. And in this meeting, we discussed big, big issues. What's your vision for a more, more culturally vibrant Boston? If the plan is a complete success, what does success look like? What do you think are the top two or three planning topics that need to be addressed by the Boston Creates process? What should we be planning about? What are some big, bold stretch goals for Boston's cultural life? 
Um, we had a fantastic turnout, um, and it really teed us up for um, a much more extensive community process that has been rolling out through the rest of the summer. Um, and that work has been undertaken primarily by 16 community teams. They're led by a pair of co-chairs, all volunteer. The pair of co-chairs formed a team of about 10 to 20 core members, depending on the population of the area. And we uh, gave them all kinds of training and support but left it up to them to best figure out what were the, what were the questions um, and what were the methods that would best reach the people in their community. And we called it organized freedom. And people have been expressing their gratitude for the opportunity to be heard. This is a handwritten thank you note that I received after the town hall meeting. Um, and a little bit more about um, what our neighborhood process looked like. So I mentioned our 16 neighborhood teams and a youth team. Um, this is just a little bit of a glimpse of what was happening in each of them. So they roughly correspond to the neighborhoods, Charlestown, East Boston, Roslindale, Alston Brighton, on and on. Um, we also held meetings in um, a variety of foreign languages, sometimes right at the meeting, um, being bilingual and other times dedicated foreign language meetings. Um, we also continued our work with focus groups in the month of July. Again, deep dive into networks and stakeholders, people um, from a variety of different sectors, not just arts and culture. Um, we also had a presence at many, many events further trying to extend our reach, not really asking people to come to meetings, but going to where the people are. Even had the flip charts out at the farmer's market. Um, if that's where everybody is in Roslindale on a Saturday morning, that's where, that's where our team chose to be. Um, we had a big, at the midway point of our public engagement process, we had a one-day blitz of concurrent meetings in every single neighborhood. This was on August 1st. We even made it into the Boston Globe, which was very, very validating. Um, so to date, we've had over 100 meetings, some of them carried out by our 16 neighborhood teams, some of them done under the auspices of a do-it-yourself conversation. So if you didn't feel like the schedule fit your needs, you can actually convene a group of your own. We encouraged youth to um, be involved in the different community teams and youth told us, you know what, no, we want our own team. <laughs> we don't feel that comfortable with the adults, so we wanna have our own conversation. Um, and these are just a few glimpses from the uh, youth teams. Um, we also engaged in um, asset mapping. This is uh, actually a map that's gonna be on our website through the whole entire process, so until June of 2016. You can go here and drop a pin and tell us about where you create, where you participate in art, and sort of what you envision for Boston in the future. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we've incorporated artists in our public engagement. This is Kate and Maria. They run an artist collective called the Department of Play. And of course, we wouldn't be true to our values if we didn't incorporate artists um, in our process. So they conceived a way of leveraging our engagement and taking a little step further. So they were involved in training our community co-chair uh, team captains. Um, they took inspiration from the mapping process and then actually created artworks and went out to where the thing was that was on the map that people envisioned for the future and executed a performance art piece um, and then fully documented that. Um, and they've also devised um, a play exercise that we primarily used with youth. They took the B of Boston Creates, made these interlocking blocks and then engaged youth actually in a play exercise that helped them build and envision the future, and then again used this to populate the asset map and get people thinking about um, what does the future of Boston look like? Just another form of engaging people. 
They also issued an RFP and asked for other artists to be involved. So they ended up engaging three additional artists, kind of artist ethnographers, to help be embedded in the engagement process and then devise creative approaches to further reach people and further explore people in this visioning exercise. So one of the artists came up with um, bread making meetings where you actually would be making bread and while you're engaged in one activity, you're talking about creative approaches to the future of Boston. Um, there's also a photographer who's been um, attending public meetings, has been to over 50 meetings and is documenting the process and we're discussing how to share that work. Um, and yet another artist has taken all the written work from the flip charts and the post-it notes and is making a work of art that we're gonna share with the public in a very creative way, which I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna give away, I don't wanna spoil the surprise, but you'll hear about it when it happens. Um, and she was inspired by people at a public meeting saying, well, we're doing this work, we're writing our flip charts. Is Julie Burroughs gonna see this work? Is the mayor gonna see what we're writing? And so she was very inspired by that question is literally taking that writing and we'll be expressing that in a, in a very public way. Um, we're continuing the end of this month with yet another round of focus groups, starting to get a little bit further afield um, and, uh, and exploring connections with other fields, such as the Arts and Healing Network. Um, something that's so exciting about having a, such a long public process is ideas are starting to percolate and inspire other aspects of our engagement. So later this month, um, we'll have a young adult town hall that was actually inspired by an early focus group with a group called City Awake, who are a network of young creative people very focused on social entrepreneurship. So the public process is not only yielding ideas, but it's also uh, inspiring cohesion, which is exactly what it's been designed to do. So what does a successful process look like? Um, it's one that will be have driven by truly diverse participation and voices. It will be engagement that yields an authentic description of Boston's creative capital. It'll help engender greater civic leadership. We'll devise strategies that are realistic as well as having some stretch goals. And it'll be a strategy that's endorsed by our governance groups, endorsed by the public and adopted by the mayor. The timeline for the plan has us doing analysis and synthesis this fall and issuing a draft plan um, early next year, engaging the public in feedback and then publishing a final plan in June of 2016. And we do fully expect to have pilot and implementation projects ready to announce at the time that we announce the final plan. So I know that this session was billed as feedback from the public process, but as you can see, we are still in the thick of it. We will have a summary of the public process and top line findings available in about a month that we'll publicly share and then further explore in a town hall meeting at the end of October. So I invite you to join us at that meeting. We'll get it out of the way early in the day and then you can celebrate Halloween after. Um, and finally, I just want to um, thank you so much for inviting me to share this information with you today. And the cultural plan, what we really hope to accomplish for Boston is increased creative capital, um, increased cultural equity, um, alignment, of community cultural priorities. We know that every neighborhood is gonna have differences, difference of opinions, different needs, but that there will be some common threads that unite all of them. Um, we're trying to achieve alignment of public and private resources and increased recognition of Boston as a cultural leader. Thank you very much.
So I don't know if we have planned to have a Q and A session. Yes, Joan says yes. Great. I will take questions and discussion. If you raise your hand, I'll recognize you. Okay, in the back. Yeah. Um, well, I have to say it's been an amazing opportunity to get a second crack at this, <laughs> really. Um, and our, the public process is very, very different. It's much more decentralized here in Boston, kind of recognizing that neighborhood identity is, is so important. Um, and that the needs really are very different in, in the neighborhoods. In, in Chicago, we had one um, community meeting in um, sort of in the decentralized, and, and here we've had a much more iterative uh, public engagement process. We were able to engage artists in our process. Um, so it's, it's been a, a much more extensive public process. One of the other things that's really very different is having a leadership council named at the beginning of the process. It's something we didn't do in Chicago and about a year afterwards, we're feeling that we needed a stewardship group to help with implementation and then engaged an external partner to help us with that, but it was, um, it was too little too late, I think. So the, the having a leadership council on board from the beginning uh, was another big change. Um, those are two of the biggest, the biggest changes, I would say. Oh, uh-huh. Boston <laughs> right no this is a very good question that we've been mindful of from the beginning and didn't really have this issue in Chicago so much Chicago's geography was so large that it really encompassed the 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 majority of the ecosystem the creative ecosystem let's say and it's very true that here in Boston the geography the political boundaries are different from what comprises the creative ecosystem. Um, so we've been really mindful from this uh, from the beginning. So our leadership council actually has about a third of its members who are not Boston residents, which is very unusual for a leadership entity convened by the city. Um, we never, deliberately never turned anyone away. Anyone who wanted to participate in any of the meetings, no matter where you lived or worked, was welcome to participate. And um, you might have missed, but one of the focus groups, um, working groups, is, is called the um, Inner, Core, Inner Core Working Group. And um, it was really the result of uh, collaboration with the Metropolitan Area Planning Commissioner Council, I can't remember, MAPC. Um, MAPC uh, received a proposal from the city of Somerville saying, uh, we'd like to create an arts and culture toolkit. And that um, proposal uh, evolved into a working group of 12 municipalities Boston, I, don't, I, I will fail to name them all, but it's Chelsea, Somerville, I think Malden just joined, maybe Medford, Revere, uh, Watertown, Brookline, I don't think Newton is involved, but, but so we're 11 municipalities um, meeting on a regular basis, about a monthly basis, with the support of the Metropolitan Planning Council to expand our capacity 
to incorporate arts and culture into municipal work. Not every municipality has um, an arts commissioner. A lot of times it's the planning director. Sometimes it's a separate arts council. So it's a, it's a, um, a diverse group. And we're actually working together because something we really recognize is that the solutions and implementation of what we come up with in the cultural plan will have to go beyond Boston's borders. But my tools in the municipality stop at the borders. So how do you address that, right? And we think by collaboration and maybe leveraging some tools that do go beyond borders. So for example, NIFA, the New England Foundation for the Arts, has some programs, although they serve all of New England, they have certain programs that are sort of within the 495 highway. Some are specific to Boston, some are from different states. So it's a very unique situation for Boston, but we're trying to be as collaborative as possible and, and really leverage our solutions. And some of the things that might be um, uh, included our uh, Somerville, for example, has come up with very innovative zoning um, for to allow sort of maker spaces. Why should we reinvent the wheel on maker space friendly zoning? Let's let's see if that's a template or a model for our other municipalities. Boston has an artist housing program that's pretty small, but we have artist certification. Maybe we can make that artist certification reciprocal within all of our municipalities and have an um, artist housing program that goes as region wide. Um, because frankly, the city of Boston probably will never be able to produce enough affordable artist live work housing units within its boundaries. And the affordable tax credits are actually a state program. So there's layers and layers and layers of ways that we could collaborate on solutions um, that, that go beyond Boston's borders. Um, so it, maybe it's, it's a, um, a strength that I'm from outside of Boston um, and that I, I don't have to, um, you know, I don't, I don't have any preconceived notions about what, what our neighbors, you know, what they are or aren't capable of. Oh my God, lots of questions. Okay, let's go right here in front. Mass creative, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so okay, your first question. The, the arts czar of the BPS is a lady named Myron Parker Brass. Do you know her, do you know Myron? She's on our cultural plan steering committee, so she's on our team. And um, I have joined the Advestors Advisory Board, so that's their key partner. Um, Tommy Chang, you should know, is, um, knows how to play the violin, violin player, um, so a music guy and a, a kind of a, a self-described high school guy. And uh, they've been working on a high school curriculum redesign 
all summer. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in the Boston Public Schools. And I know that the requirement you're talking about, um, it's, it actually is required to graduate from high school that you have at least one arts and culture credit. A lot of kids have trouble fulfilling that credit because the school actually doesn't offer the program. But what BPS has started to do is officially recognize out of school programs that can qualify and you can get your credit in a summer program or an after school program. That's really great. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to improve the system to actually officially recognize all of the youth arts and culture programs that meet the requirements so that kids can get their credits. So there's, there's a lot of work to do in terms of that and, and to make it easier to collaborate. And, and I will say it's one of the big successes of the Chicago Cultural Plan was the resulting arts education plan um, and this sort of system-wide assessment of arts and culture offerings within the public schools and then led to um, actually their partner is called Ingenuity. They're like investors and actually very much modeled on the partnership between BPS and investors. Um, and it's resulted in um, multi-million dollar investments in Chicago. So the cultural plan here in Boston can be a platform to bring more support, more advocacy, more um, urgency to accelerate those efforts. I'm very optimistic that we can achieve a lot because of the cultural plan. Um, that was the first question. Did I also answer the second question too? Your, your organization is at oh, at, M, at, the, at Mass Cultural Council. Well, I've just actually joined the MCC um, policy advisory group. I work, I meet regularly with Matt. We have like a standing monthly meeting. So we're collaborating pretty deeply. Um, I do not have a meeting tomorrow on my calendar with the MCC, so I wasn't invited to that meeting. But, um, you know, I, we can certainly reach out to Matt and see what's happening. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Great, and there were, a, thank you so much. <laughs> In the back? you so much that's so nice of you right yeah um, you know I think that advocacy is huge and um, letting the governor know how important the Massachusetts Cultural Council is what they're all laughing wait do you work <laughs> what <laughs> oh that's hilarious look at me I like step right into it um, I didn't even know that um, well so but anyway yes right it's a huge deal that the Mass Cultural Council um, and by the way in com com not not to say anything against my colleagues in Illinois but the Mass Cultural Council is extremely well run extremely organized I am so impressed by what the Mass Cultural Council is doing really very impressive and um, it's fantastic that there was an increase this year and that we had the support to you know override the governor's veto and it's great that we got a renewal of the mass uh, the, the cultural facilities fund but it's very important uh, despite the increase in the the um, the budget it's it's far below its peak so money it matters um, we're going to be asking um, people, you know, the, the foundations to support arts and culture. We're going to be asking the mayor to continue to support. We'll be asking the BRA to consider different kinds of public benefits from development that will help us to implement the plan. So we could really use support um, through advocacy, but we could also really use um, help getting the word out our survey that is um, has gone out to 
um, hopefully all of Boston, you know, we could really use um, help in getting the word out and just, you know, showing up at meetings. It really helps us. Um, I don't know, I check back with me in a, in, a, in a couple of months and I might have more specific actions to be taken. But right now, while we're in the public engagement, it's just to stay engaged, I think. Stephen? Um, one of our September focus groups is with the Greater Boston Convention and Visitor Bureau and their board and, and for leaders in the tourism industry. Just anecdotally, I have not seen that the cultural assets of Boston are marketed in a way that I think um, they could be. I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of room for growth. And I've seen cultural tourism marketing actually in Chicago be enormously successful um, and taking special, special cultural experiences and really fully marketing them, um, not only to the people who come here already, but the people who might decide to come here because of what's going on. Um, whether it's in a very different tourism market here than in Chicago, in Chicago um, a far less kind of per capita, um, a far, they had just a lot more room for growth, um, especially from international tourism in Chicago. And here, um, they say uh, that if Boston really actually, is for the size of the city, draws um, a far greater percentage of tourism, especially from overseas. So it's a, it's a pretty different tourism market and we're still kind of diving into that. Although one of the results of the Chicago Cultural Plan was to do a cultural tourism strategy for Chicago, which now unfortunately um, is being complete, the whole, the whole tourism bureau in Chicago is being defunded um, because the state is broke, so that's a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna start using mics for questions actually for the live stream, so. Um, maybe related to uh, tourism, the, le the last thing you said actually was uh, to have Boston gain recognition as a, as a cultural leader. Yeah. And um, so my question is about the values that you showed. And I, um, I applaud the cultural equity and creative capital agenda. Um, none of those values, as I quickly scanned them, you didn't leave it up very long, but uh, spoke to some kind of external evaluation. So there wasn't a statement of excellence or innovation or experimentation or notability. Um, and so I just think uh, to include something like that, some standard to hold ourselves to that is more, um, I don't wanna say objective, and, well there's imagination and innovation, terrific. Um, and accountability. I know, I went a little fast. All right, so it was just, I just couldn't good. read fast enough. They're pretty but, good, but yeah. there, maybe there is something missing, But right? Well, I would, you know, in, if you want to get a Wikipedia article, you need to meet a test of notability. notability. And so if we're going to be recognized as a cultural leader, how is this going to make us notable, and what can we publicize that both helps us achieve the cultural capital goals right. and the recognition goals? So, but don't forget, these values are for cultural planning. They're not necessarily the articulated aspirations for the entire cultural community. So maybe that's, maybe that's what we're aiming towards, is what are the aspirations for the entire cultural community, um, which, is, which is different, right? Um, you know, maybe we become the new work capital of the US. Um, right, by, by premiering more new works than any other place. We could maybe even claim that right now. Um, and then that is notable. And, and it could be that we are this incredible R&D lab for cultural product that gets then distributed globally. Yep. 
Shaw. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering, I'm, I may have missed it, but um, is there a way that you have either gotten or could get um, feedback from this room, from the six theaters, uh, in terms of either our aspirations or needs or, um, you know, as a, a collection of theaters, maybe, you know, individually or aggregated in some, uh, you know, some way. Yeah. Uh, Before you, know, you continue, let me just answer yeah. that one. Um, so we will be at the Stage Source Theater Expo and we'll be holding a session actually right before the expo starts. It's completely open. Um, and I would really encourage you guys to come and attend or send someone from your company. Um, uh, we would love to have you. And that would be a, a formal way to be involved in a focus group that we're having. So that would be, that would be terrific. It's on September 29th. I think at one o'clock, something like that. But I can, your, I can your get. Meeting. Right, it's at it's at the Stage Source Theater Expo, and it's r literally just right before their expo starts. And deliberately planned to take advantage of the fact that they were doing that expo. I think it's on September 29th. Yeah, it's at September 29th at the Cyclorama uh, from noon to two. And also, we've got ten more minutes in this section. So I think you maybe had another part of your um, question. Whether there whether there was a way if we um, collaborated. Uh, for us to look at our issues and needs and send them to you. Yeah, absolutely. You could do um, essentially a do-it-yourself conversation. Um, and we have a toolkit and a framework, and so you can discuss and then send us in the results of that discussion. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Another, another thing we can do together that we... Yay, yeah, another better meeting. Than separately. <laughs> Can the city of Boston fund a theater bus? Yeah. A theater bus. Yeah. Um, to pick people up who don't have yeah. transportation and take them places for cultural, it doesn't yes. have to be just theater. You know, actually, I'd like you to know that um, the Strand Theater, which is operated by my staff, um, Fiddlehead Theater Company, I don't know if they're here, or part of this group. Fiddlehead is actually running a trolley from Coffley Square to the Strand Theater um, for this whole season of shows because it is hard to get there, it's hard to park when you're there. So that's maybe an instructive pilot to take a look at. Um, our grant season is open right now. So if you guys want to uh, submit a grant to the Boston Cultural Council, um, we would love to you know, entertain. We have more money this year. So um, the thing is, if you're not located in the city of Boston, but your program takes place in the city of Boston, we can fund you. But if you're not located in the city of Boston, your program does not happen in the city of Boston, we can't fund you. So maybe some collaborations could happen because of that. The deadline is October 15th for that, by the way. Uh, so Julie, we know that the um there's not a lot of corporate headquarters here anymore, but there's obviously a lot of concentrations of corporate money in the city of Boston. The biotech, financial industries, we can go outside and count cranes and see all the investment going on on the waterfront from Fidelity. And so I'm just curious if you have had any success or if you've had any of these players raising their hands thus far, saying that they're interested in being uh, a part of the cultural plan and if there's any way that uh, we can work with you and help assist that effort in bringing more of those players to the table. Yeah, you'll see that one of our September focus groups, and this, these are happening 28th, 29th, 30th, so later this month. Um, we do have a group of corporate philanthropists, corporate giver groups um, invited to discuss what are their interests. I've met with um, a, f a handful of corporate givers. Um, I will say that in, in my experience, they're much more um, inclined to support 
publicly facing events versus um, kind of cultural planning, cultural policy. They're never going to give me money to regrant to other people. Um, and that, that's what I've found. Um, but we're really eager to engage them in a discussion. I personally think that one of the most valuable ways corporations can support arts and culture groups is by having their employees on boards of groups. And that's the kind of relationship that fosters giving to those groups. I don't know how many of you have actively sought board members from corporations or worked with the Arts and Business Council to get corporations to pay for their young up and coming executives to go through the board training program and get placed with arts organizations. But it's really, corporate giving is all about relationships and it's very transactional. So, you know, that's the reality. It's not really philanthropy. It's much more about marketing. Um, and you actually offer access to very valuable demographics most of the time. So if you think of it in that, of that, in that transactional kind of way, you know, it could be fruitful. Any other questions? Well, all right, this was a great discussion. Thank you so much. I don't know who's next. <laughs>